What's up, guys? This is David, a.k.a. Reverse Long. Today I have a, a three-way uh, interview kind of thing. And for, I wanted to introduce also Sam Putnam. He, Sam is a, a newer trader. He's been putting in a lot of work. I've been in contact with him for a, many months now. Um, and he's been following through with all his, uh, his dil due diligence and studying and putting in a lot of hours. And so I, I told him, you know, he can go... go uh, go check out some traders to see for the podcast and um, come up with some questions and we can uh, use the podcast as a platform for, to help his learning. And, you know, me, I always, I'm always interested in learning from others and also getting to, to know traders um, through the podcast. And I've been following we, we today we have Bryce Tui. Bryce Tui uh, is in the Tim challenge as well. And I've uh, actually, I was inspired from his podcast with Matt Monaco uh, beyond the PDT. Um, a couple of years ago. So like, that's how I started this podcast. So I can use it as a vehicle for learning. And that's been my number one priority. Just use the podcast as a, a way to further the learning and to solidify things. And uh, that's all been inspired by Matt Monaco and Bryce Tui. And uh, now they got the whole steady trade thing going on, small cap recap. So I think they got like a rockets room and all this kind of stuff. And uh, Bryce is always really entertaining to, to listen to and his small cap recaps, which is great, man. They, they sum up the market every day. And uh, you are all here trading small caps. So, all right. So, yes, yeah, Sam, you uh, you want to start first? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, David. Yeah, no problem. So, Bryce and Matt beyond the PGT uh, is still out there for anyone watching it. So, it's the same information. It's just as good as it was a year or two ago. Um, for people who like big numbers, you know, if you haven't come across Bryce on YouTube and Small Cap Rockets, uh, he took his account over 500K. Uh, back in April or May, and it's continuing. And so it's really great to have him here on the podcast. And Bryce, could you tell us a little bit about, for people who haven't come across you yet, uh, your background in, in trading? Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me on, guys. Um, so I've been trading now for, oh man, three, three and a half, uh, coming on, going on four, no, probably about four years now. I started very late 2017, just kind of in the studying phase. Uh, back when I was in college, I actually met Matt Monaco through a mutual friend and he kind of just got me into trading. He had been trading probably about eight months ahead of me at that point, but definitely was putting in a lot of work and it just really intrigued me. I was like, you know what? I've been really kind of wanting to, um, I knew I, I even a, my sophomore year of college, I knew that like working a nine to five job really wasn't right for me where I didn't have control over myself, control over my ability to make or lose money. Um, and I just wanted something that was a little bit more, you know, free, freeing feeling. So that, that sort of freedom, maybe didn't even need to be financial freedom. I didn't care what I did uh, for a while as a freelance writer. That's actually what paid my way through school, um, paid for my rent, my food, my car, my phone, all that stuff. Um, and it was, it was nice, you know, I was making decent money then, but it was you know, enough to live, oh, again, get through school, I guess. It was just nice being able to work when I wanted, where I wanted, and kind of how I wanted. Um, and that, that type of mindset was like really what encouraged me to keep pushing to really kind of get this whole trading thing down, right? Where I was like, this is a fantastic feeling, but what if I could be making more money where I don't need to set rates, I can instead set risk and in theory, then set reward as well. Um, and so for the next two years on and off, uh, basically really the end of 2019, uh, beginning or end of 2017 to the end of 2019, it was kind of sporadic uh, in terms of my dedication to trading. You know, I wasn't putting in as much work all the times I should have been, but I was watching the markets. I was placing some degenerate trades, tracking a little bit of data. Um, but then really like once uh, summer of 2019, came around, uh, I really started, and of course that was when the market kind of really started slowing down too, but I decided I wanted to start putting a lot more focus into this. And basically from there on, you know, went uh, six, seven, eight hours, nine hours a day, just trying to balance school, learning how to trade, um, and of course working my freelance writing as well. And then basically towards the end of that year and into 2020, that, you know, six, seven, eight, nine hours, quickly became 12, 13, 14 hours a day where I was skipping class. I was 
um, basically only trading and writing at the time. And I was just kind of just trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Ended up dropping out of school um, in 2020 because that was really when that market started heating up. And I just figured, you know what, I can, I can always go back to school, but I can't always get this kind of market condition. Um, and so I dropped out after having, you know, put in a lot of screen time over the past year and even a bit more from the previous three years at that point. And, you know, from there, it's just kind of my, my knowledge has continued to grow. My account has continued to grow. And I mean, this to me is still just the beginning, you know, I'm, I know, I'm, I think at about 850,000 right now and it's, it's great, but you know, I'm a lot of my, a lot of the people I trade with and a lot of my good friends, that's, that's, uh, I'm kind of where they were about a year ago now. So it's like my, I keep using them as that motivation to keep pushing forward. Um, and yeah, that's kind of long story short on how I got into trading where I'm at now. Awesome. Yeah. So Bryce, um, so, okay. So when you had the, the beyond the T podcast, what, like, what was the big turning point for you? Cause like, I remember you guys used to interview, like you were like in Sam's position right now and uh, you were interviewing traders like, like 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 yourself and uh like so how how was it what the process when you guys would interview the the traders and like to get yourself in that community and to like start when did you start having confidence that like uh you can you can uh you can be really successful in this um that's that's a good question so i can't even i can't remember how long ago we started that podcast i want to say it was it was either 2018 it was probably no beginning of 2019 um and it for so long, it was weird, but you know, at that point in time, it's kind of newer on Twitter. Um, it was like seeing all these people posting these big numbers and I just, I couldn't personally get it down nor, nor could Matt at the time. And it almost seemed like these people were fake on Twitter. Sometimes You're like, do people actually make money doing this? Um, and then once we started getting on the podcast or getting that podcast going, one of the first big things was like, okay, these people are legit, like they're real. And they have clearly just put in the work, they put in the work, they put in a lot of work, and they've really refined the process. It's not going from strategy to strategy, they had their own thing that worked for them. And they just kept working on refining that. And that's why they were starting to find that exponential growth. And that was when it clicked to me, the biggest aha moment for me was I'd keep going back and forth between strategies, between long and short and different indicators and different patterns. And once they, I mean, every, everyone we had talked to obviously had their own unique way of trading, but being able to talk to them really kind of got me in the mindset, like of understanding which patterns, which strategies, which setups work best for different kinds of traders. Um, and so then once I started listening to these guys as patterns or setups and everything, I kind of started thinking, all right, what what out of everything I've heard so far, what sounds the best to work for me? And that's when I realized listed longs were kind of the, 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 what I wanted to focus on. And instead of switching around from strategy to strategy, it was more trying to work on refining, okay, how is the best way for me to trade a breakout? Because there are so many different ways to trade breakouts, so many different kinds of breakouts. Um, and I guess that aha moment, the thing that really clicked for me was really just trying to refine my own edge after knowing like what worked for me, but obviously the connections you get to make on these podcasts are fantastic. Um, and even just little things, obviously we already know how important trading psychology, risk management is, but really having that re-emphasized every single episode. I've never talked to a successful trader who does not have an emphasis on risk management ever. Um, and so having that really just ingrained in my head through, I think we did 20 of those episodes that was huge for me too. That was uh, kind of studying your studying how to perfect or work on perfecting, refining your risk management, and getting over those emotional hurdles. Uh, those are also really big kind of turning points for me. And uh, okay, and I don't want to take all Sam's Sam's questions, but uh, okay. So and then, so what made you gravitate towards listed longs? I mean, because you know, like you got the other traders there that you interviewed a lot of them do OTCs or at least Jack Jack did and you know and Tim of course uh so what 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 was the biggest um difference for you between the OTC longs and the listed longs really the patience factor um that's that's the biggest thing and for me I, I a lot of 
the guys we interviewed on that were OTC traders. Uh, we did have, we did have a few listed long traders and, you know, at, at the time I kind of, the big took takeaway I got was the, the patience level required for li uh, listed versus OTC and not to say OTCs don't move fast because by percentage, when you get in the right one, that it really does, but you're also risking a wider percentage. Um, and slippage, I found slippage to be a lot worse on OTCs. I struggle getting filled. If I'm trying to slam the bid to sell into half the time, you just don't get filled, getting caught in panics. Like that is not stress I want to deal with. I like being in and out of trades in like five, 10, 20 minutes. Um, just really picking key pivot spots, key areas in that chart where if it's going to work, it's going to work right here, right now. If it's not going to work, I'm able to cut it for a relatively small loss. Um, and that's obviously a more scalpy strategy, which is basically how I first started trading listed longs. I definitely have a few setups where I have no issue holding for all day using a really hard risk level like low a day. Um, but the patience that I found trading OTCs is just, it's too much, it's too stressful for me. Um, and especially like not being able to set a hard stop because you will, if it's more uh, actually really, regardless of liquidity, those stops are pretty hard to get filled on uh, with size. So that was, that was the big reason for me that I didn't want to trade them. And small account commissions all yeah. that. I mean, the commissions alone were like <laughs> half of my gains on those trades. Yeah. Sam, uh, any, any other questions, Sam? Yeah. Um, well, it's just, it makes me think of, uh, there was a trader named uh, Connor who did really well last year and he had a, an account with, I guess, RBC that had really good fills on OTCs. And that's only one tiny factor in his success, but it, uh, it, I, I do appreciate hearing about the, you know, they move slow, but it's still hard to get hit the bid. That's interesting to hear. Yeah, um, I started with, with, I mean, we all start with kind of experimenting with OTCs if we are in the Tim challenge, right? That's kind of like, you got to step into it a little bit. And yeah, I always found that they just, they move slow and, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I, being in and out is much more, you can maneuver differently, but you know, that's why you got to test things out for your personality. Maybe some people are better with that. Also, um, you got to have E-Trade and, uh, you know, the fills are sometimes you don't get filled like right away. It's like a tricky with the fills. So that's another patience thing. Um, and that's, you know, some people, it's really a personality thing. I mean, you can definitely learn to do it. I think anybody can do it because, you know, you see all, all the people doing it and it, the, the successful people doing it, Tim does it, anybody can do it, but you really got to like train for it differently than you train for other stocks, you know, the liquidity, the broker fills, you know, are you going to be antsy, you know, and if you're doing both, like, like when you think of Jack Kellogg, this guy really is getting to be like that, that Matt, like, I mean, he's like a master. He can go between long, short, OTC, listed, this guy's like in the matrix. You know what I mean? <laughs> he is a, he's really amazing when it comes to like his, um, how diverse he is with different trading setups. Now, and I guess, you know, I'm sure that comes with time and a lot of work. I mean, that man's put in yeah. more work than most, most that I know. Um, now, okay, let's, let's go into the, okay, so, so I, I, I want to ask a couple of questions about the, the work that you put in because, okay, so at first glance, um, people think, oh, it's, it's, they see Bryce Tui with the music on, with the cowboy hat, you know, he's having fun over here. Oh yeah, you know, making it look easy. But, uh, you know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've been following you for years, man. I remember when I was struggling in the beginning, uh, I would listen to your podcast all the time. Then the steady trade slowly came on. And I remember like walking down LA, going on hikes and just trying to get my, you know, trying to get in there profitable. And, I, you know, finally I got profitable. I'm trying to get it, get it to the next level now. Like you guys, you know, I got to step it up. But, um. So, so how much work did you put in like in the beginning I, like just to make it clear like for Sam and for other people like because you know you, you, it looks easy the way you do it now but it, it definitely for like how long how, how much front-loaded hardcore like work ethic did you put in the beginning to you know to like kind of have fun with it now or like now you're enjoying it you know like you're it seems like you're having fun while, while throughout the whole experience yeah, hundred um, percent. In terms of the work, like I said in the very beginning, when I first got introduced to trading, I didn't take it seriously enough. Kind of just wanted to get rich quick, like everyone. And then for like those first two years, it, it was it was just 
you know, very basic data tracking, um, very basic, like looking at charts and trying to kind of see what works and maybe buying a high a day break or something like that and trying to track that. But the more that I got into it again, and this was mainly 2019 when this started picking up, um, my process basically turned, actually, I guess, yeah, this is towards the end of 2019 at this point, this process that I'm about to go through um, was wake up at 5 a.m. Um, and this was Eastern time. So market open at 9.30 there. Go to the gym, come back, make my watch, or uh, go through my pre-market scans. And I guess technically it starts the day before with the watch list I make the day before. But um, go through pre-market scans, see what's moving pre-market, see if it impacted any of my previous day's watch list. Uh, try to go through that and then create a plan for each ticker that I want to trade. Um, that would lead up to about 7.30 to 8 a.m. Uh, after having breakfast. Obviously trade for the first two hours of the day. And then midday would be for basically going over previous day's trade, seeing what I did wrong, wrong, where I did wrong, and then making note of those really important mistakes or things I did really well. Come back for like the last two hours of the day, trade there journal specifically for every single trade I took for about two and a half hours at the end of the day, and then create a watch list for the next day based on stocks that performed well or were holding key ranges, key areas that I felt were important, um, and then do it all again the next day. So it was more, I, I learned pretty quick, you know, I, at the time when I was on Twitter, I saw a lot of uh, people I, I respected in the trading community talking a lot about data and gathering data. And for me, for some reason, that data always seems to have to mean like hard numbers, like hard core um, like probabilities of a setup working this way and how often it reacts to an indicator and this and that. And what I learned, what works best for me is data on my like personal emotions, the way I personally take a trade. Um, and that was probably like overall the biggest turning point in my trading career was once I kept writing down the same mistake over and over and over again. I would literally go into a trade and say, okay, wait a minute. Am I going to make this mistake if I take this trade? And if I was leaning towards probably, what I'd do is maybe take half size or ideally not take the trade at all. Um, and that was the big thing for me, gathering data on how I emotionally handled trades, biggest mistakes, best things I did well. That was that type of data that worked for me. But I mean, it was at least two and a half hours worth of journaling every day and then taking midday too to also go through and uh, go over those trades, almost like a pre-journaling in the middle of the day. And throughout there, I'd try to sprinkle in um, some level two recordings, tape recordings when I could, when I had time in the middle of the day, if I didn't have a lot I wanted to go over, but a lot of work. I mean, it was, it was most days were over 12 hours a day of strictly stocks. And then, I mean, that was, it was crazy, but it was so, so obviously so worth it. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned level two. So how much does level two work? Go go with uh, with your 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 longs, with listed longs. Huge. It's a big part of it. It's not necessarily an indicator I use to determine an entry or exit, but it's a really big confirmation factor for me for how much size I can take. Um, kind of what basically what I'm using level two for is to kind of get an idea of an agenda of a potential big like big money i'm trying to follow big money and that's one of the big things for me is a lot of my listed long setups are not after the move has been made it's not buying a dip off of a already strong stock it's finding a stock that's being held up well on the daily generally that has some type of agenda behind it some kind of big buyer and you can normally see that developing in the tape over, or the level two over a few days and so i'm using that basically as a confirmation of all right are there bidders here? Are they gonna keep bidding this up? Can I take enough size or do I need to size down? Um, and then I'm using the daily chart, obviously daily chart intraday to determine those exact spots. And then what I'm using that for as well uh, is to start knowing when to taking off, start knowing when to take off some size if the trade is working. Um, I'm looking for those big bidders, big asks at key areas on the chart. Maybe that's where after a spike, once I see that big ask come through, take off a little bit, give it some room, or the opposite, if a big bidder is getting taken out, I'll sell some into that. Um, so it's, again, not necessarily like hardcore, you know, this is, I'm only trading based on the level two, but definitely a good confirmation uh -huh. of my thesis. Um, the, the ones that went crazy, what is it, yesterday, DWAC, um, what's the other one? Uh, fun. Did you trade yeah. those at all? 
Uh, did you trade anything crazy yesterday? No, I traded DWAC um, on the dip off of the halts. I took it at $85 and it, so it bounced up to like 98 immediately after I got filled. And I was like, score. And then it came right back down and broke my, broke that previous candles low by like $2. And I sold for a quick game because I was like, I'm not I'm in the mood to get caught in another halt down. I so see, that yeah, was the so, only, and I took very small size too. Yeah. So that was a crazy haul play. But um, I was asking because I didn't realize it was, it was a crazy, like you played it during the craziness. But like, what, does level two come in, in handy for you if you were to play like for those kind of, no, right? Like no, you're looking more, for like, uh huh. Yeah, those, those wildly volatile stocks, you can get some, and from, in my opinion, the way, the way that I guess I use level two, like you can get some information on there. Like you can find, you can find those big bid props at key areas, but like it really, it not nearly as important um, to me as playing something that, I'm looking for that pre-move um, after, after it's gone that crazy, gotten that volatile. It's too yeah. fast for me. Too fast for me to read. So you're, you're looking like for like an afternoon breakout kind of thing. The consolidation is forming and then maybe like some big bidder step in before power hour. And you're like, okay, is that something like that? Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's, that's one of my favorite afternoon setups is finding that the stock that had kind of had shown some signs of strength, but not, not necessarily like a mainstream top percent gainer of the day, holding up uh -huh. really well into the afternoon. Then I'm always, I'm just stalking a level two for like hours trying to find, all right, are they bidding it up? Or they, is there hidden buying going on? I mean, a lot of times you'll see no, it seems like no bidders in sight and you'll see a huge sell order go right into them. And yeah. they just, you know, like there should not be this much volume. They should have been like they should have been showing size on level two. Like that's those are the things I'm looking for. And then ideally that afternoon, uh, if I'm seeing that consolidating all afternoon, I'm assuming that they're gonna try to push it into power hour and then I'll have a risk level as well. That's cool. So you use video in order to like really get better at that. Is that what you did? Yeah, so I would, yeah, I would basically just record a uh, screen, like screen record some of the hottest stocks of the day, and then basically just start off saying, okay when the stock gets to key resistance, key support, what does it do in the level two? What are the bidders like? What are the exchanges like? Like all of that stuff, looking at that and uh, really only focusing on the key areas. And then from there, just kind of developed into watching it real time and learning from it real time. That's pretty cool. Um, all right, so I wanted to ask also, because we, we all kind of go into trading and we have like a friend in, in real life that we want to trade with, but it, they just don't, it doesn't work. It, they get, you know, it doesn't, doesn't, they get left behind. <laughs> How yeah. did you, uh, you, you and, and Matt are like a rare case. Did you guys push each other or like, how, how did, how did that come about? Cause like both of you became really successful and you got a lot, you know, you just, cause you started, basically you guys started from nothing. If you look at beyond the PDT, you guys are there asking like, uh, you're like, you know, in awe, it seems like when I, when I listen to those episodes now in hindsight, it's like, you know, you guys are straight fresh, you know, like, <laughs> and then, you know, so how, how did you guys make it work? Both of you guys, you know, like to motivate really each other. I really think it came down to like a work ethic thing. Actually, Matt and I, um, I mean, we, we did kind of bounce some ideas off because we were, we were roommates in college when this was going on. Right. And like, we would bounce some ideas off each other, but Matt was definitely a very private person. And like, it would, we'd talk after the day was over. We'd do a little bit, but like, we weren't really working together super close knit in college. Um, but it was kind of, I, I always knew Matt would make it. Like he just, he put in more, he put in so much work in the beginning. Um, and I think it was that, that's what kept me going is I was like, I cannot be the failure here. Like, I, I'm not going to let myself be the guy who tried and then watch Matt get all big and successful. It was almost like I wanted to because I wanted to make sure that, like, Matt took me seriously. I wanted to be like, all right, he's, he's not just my dumb friend because um, I'm not necessarily, like, the, the smartest person in the room, but I'll, I'll make oh, sure. Oh, come on, man. Awesome. You, I, like, I hear Tim say, is the, like, Matt, the dumbest no, no, guy no. I know. <laughs> it's no, funny, no, no, but it's, it's like, not true. Come on, man. It's, <laughs> no, it's no, hilarious, no. but. I yeah, mean, yeah. Like, I mean, like school smart. Oh, yeah, Actually, yeah. I guess I did well in school too. <laughs> it's just like, 
I, I just, I come off stupid, but I, it's a joke, I guess. I come off way too funny. Maybe that's the problem half the time. Yeah. Yeah, your same, guy's you story, <laughs> but your guy's story almost reminds me of like co-founders in like a, a company, you know, where Matt maybe is more, uh, you know, intellectual, but you're out here working hard. You're grinding to get these writing jobs that he, it sounded like you, maybe you turned him onto that as well. Yep. And, um, yep. You're networking as well. You're connecting with people and posting on the, you know, if this stuff really matters. A hundred percent. I think that's something that is like very often overlooked in trading is this is a business just as well. Like your network is super important. And that was a really good side of like being able to do the podcast is we were able to learn a lot, throw that, like what we learned back out of the internet for any other trader that was in our situation and we got to like, again, build up that small network of traders we talked to. Most of the time, it didn't really lead to a whole lot, but like just being able to like say hi or, you know, like, okay, maybe more than hi, but like send them a DM or something and they might read it um, and then become friends with those people. Like they, and you know, when you have people that you personally know that are doing way better than you, it does, in, like, I'm a huge firm believer. You don't want to be the best person in your group. You know, you want to have those other people ahead of you. And that was like basically what it did for us was like showed us, okay, there are people who are really crushing it. We need to like get on their level. Um, so that was like a huge bonus of that podcast in, in my opinion, but networking is huge in trading. And it's as you get better, as you put in more time, as you, you know, talk to more people, that network will grow. Yeah. Um, one thing I think Matt Monaco mentioned it before is like your network is your net worth. And I, I remember, um, or something along those lines. But I remember when Matt, when uh, Steady Trade Twist was brought up, um, it was Matt Monaco was like at, I think, less than 100K or something. Jack was around 150K or 200K. Kyle, and like, you know, and look at them now. You know what I mean? They, they got all these habits. They would be on the Steady Trade every, every once a week, uh, Twist episode. And then you come along and it's like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's just a great, environment to like just uh the energy and all that success just just uh to help you grow and be better you know um it's really inspiring man no thank you yeah i'm glad i mean it's obviously you know and you were oh did you guys just get that notification too what what happened yeah. uh what I was that it, yeah. it's it said we've been upgraded to unlimited minutes did i read that right Oh, is it upgraded to a limited? I'm not sure. Is that what happened? I just I got a just, notification. Yeah. It's just a Zoom thing. I think it gives you like a trial or something. I don't know. Gotcha. Okay. Um, Joe, just, just, sorry. I didn't mean to just like interrupt that. I just saw that pop up on my screen. It was like, oh, yeah, that's cool. That? Yeah, that's um, cool. No. So uh, where where was I going with that? Um, the, um, the whole twist and uh, right, guys growing. Right, right. Man, it's getting dark in here. Um, yeah, no, like it, it, that was a big thing too. Was like when I saw Matt, you know, basically become really good friends with Jack and Kyle. I was like, man, I need to like kind of, I need to start talking to people. Like I need to start really trying to find people who are in similar shoes to me as well. Cause you know, at that point, Matt had, Matt had kind of proven himself as profitable and I was still struggling. So I was talking to other, you know, new traders and it was just, that was my biggest problem is for so long I wanted to do it alone. Um, and, and not alone in the sense where like, you know, I'd talk to Matt and everything, but I wanted to be completely, I wanted to be the only reason for my success, not have anyone else's ideas. And then I started learning, okay, like bouncing ideas off of other traders in a similar spot will help you both grow to help keep you both motivated. And, you know, that was basically how the net, like the networking side of trading was really big for me in the beginning. That's great. And what would you say, um, what, 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 uh, would you, what advice would you give to the newer traders start like uh, to start out like that? Because um, okay, so you weren't profitable. You you mentioned so like did you were you losing small, winning small? Were you trading super small account? Like how was how was your 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 the beginning days? You know, you're learning when you when you're trading while learning. Yeah, for sure. Um, the beginning was very 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 sporadic. Like no emphasis on <laughs> the like an average losing size. Um no real pattern. I was trading for a while. I was probably losing like 
$50 a trade or something like that, $20, $50. Um, I, I was trading with a small account too. You know, I, my account was only funded by whatever money I made as a freelance writer. Um, and after all my bills, after paying for school and rent and my car, like I really only had a few thousand bucks left at the end of all of it, but it was enough to like, you know, I was the big, the big problem, I guess, is, and I think a lot of new traders go through with this, right? When you've got that two or $3,000 account, your goal is to get over PDT. Like that is your main goal. And unfortunately, like you can do it in a really hot market. It's, it's not the hardest thing in the world if you've got a strategy that works. The problem is it's not realistic. Um, so, and that was my issue is like, I was like, okay, I want to get to a $10,000 account. And I just kept taking full account size trades that I'd end up losing two or 300 bucks on. I'm like, oh my God, I just lost 10% of my account in one trade. Um, and so what the big thing for me that I always tell new traders who ask now is really, really, really sizing down. If you've got like a two or $3,000 account or you're just not consistent yet, trade with like that $2 risk. Um, and that's what I did is I dropped my risk down to $2 a trade because if you can't make $2 a trade, if you can't make $4, $5 a trade, you can't make $100 a trade. I can promise that now can't make a thousand. Like you need to start small as a proof of concept. And so if you're, when you lose, you can take 10 losses straight and you lost 20 bucks. Like you, you lost probably what you'd go spend on lunch. So it's like, that's how, and, and also if you're taking $2 risk, you're taking really small size, which means if you use a cash account, even with a $2,000 account, you can probably take like five trades a day, which is what I did. So it got me obviously losing less money. It got me the ability to get a bunch of data on a bunch of different trades I was taking. And then that is what allowed me to start saying, okay, now I can start adding more money in my account. And that was a big thing for me as it was never a goal for me. You know, once I had kind of started developing a strategy, a system to grow over PDT, I had saved up enough at that point where I could add it into my account when I felt I was ready um, because yeah. I had three years of, you know, working uh, previous to that saving up money. And that's, and that's just like the truth of it is it's not, you're very likely not going to just go over PDT tomorrow. You're very likely not going to become extremely consistent tomorrow. It takes time. Um, that, and so that's what I would, I know it's a really roundabout answer to that question you had, but definitely smaller size, size down, stop focusing on the gains, focus on the experience, the knowledge and the data you can gather by trading with small size. Man, I, I love that, you know, cause uh, when I try to explain it to people, it, I, I had a similar situation. You know, I, I didn't have much money to start off a few thousand dollars. And uh, actually, it was it was a blessing in disguise because you really can't lose that much if you don't have that much. <laughs> and then you you by that you're, you're going to have enough money eventually, uh, you know, uh, if, if you are trying to, you know, if, if you have that goal to be over PDT. So then after like I think it was after like a year and a half or two years, I felt more ready and I, I finally put the money in the account. I think I, I, I understood risk management, for, you know, and, and everything much better. Now I was in a better position to start. So, yeah, you know, having a little bit of money at first is actually a blessing, a blessing in disguise. You know what I mean? And you can come. And also now, yeah, you have the cash accounts, E-Trade and a lot of brokers that, for the listed longs, especially there's no commissions, yep. you know. Uh, uh -huh. when I, when I, yeah, it's crazy. So like when I started, I remember, uh, it was like 2016, you, you have to pay like six bucks in or sometimes 10 bucks for some brokers and 10 bucks out. So you're wasting 20 bucks in the trade already, you know, now there's no commissions. You can kind of, uh, you have more, more leeway to experiment. So you want to keep yourself in the game to experiment. Cause like six months later, you're going to know a lot more than you do now. So like, you know what I mean? So yeah, starting out with a little bit of money. I know Sam, I, I looked at some of his his profit charts, so he's doing exactly that. I know Sam, you want to go into how, how you're going about it? Yeah, for any other new fur traders listening, um, I want to let, let Bryce uh, go soon so we stick to our plan. Uh, but for, for newer traders, yeah, $2 risk is, I started trading a share. My first like 500 trades were one to 10 maybe 50 shares because yeah, that's a, <laughs> it's, it's just math. No, and that's, yeah. that's so, and it's not to, to, to add on to that. If, if I can, um, I get asked all the time, like a lot of, I see one of the biggest issues most new traders have 
is they don't hold on to winners long enough and they hold on to losers too long. Even if, even if you're sticking to your risk, if you're not holding that winner, letting it run to its potential or at least to your plan, um, the, what I always tell people who are struggling with that is like, pretend like you have one share. Like, why wouldn't you let the stock run if you had one share left, right? Like, you got to treat it that same way. Treat it like you have no size as long as you're going to stick to your risk. Like, if that's going to cause you to just, you know, hold till zero, don't do that. But, you know, as long as you're able to stick to your risk, treat every trade like you've got one share, like you've got small size, and hopefully that'll help psych you out. And if that doesn't, that means you actually probably do need to size down, you know, but that's the best way. I think like you're saying one, 10, 50 shares, depending on the price of the stock. I appreciate hearing it from you. You know, someone who's successful saying that you don't hear that message every day. So it's super helpful. And, you know, to share my downfalls to this point, uh, you know, having 10 wins for one share and then having it wiped out because I bought one share of some EV SPAC after the hype had already run and seeing that on my profit chart, you know, it's crushing. But being able to separate out those strategies and saying, okay, this strategy is actually has a positive expectancy. So. No, you're 100%. Getting, yeah, you're getting the lessons in and, you know, that's the most important as, as you progress, you know what I mean? Especially for, uh, couple of years and then when you're managing real money you know you know how to you know you know more what you're doing so that's the way you're doing it right the the best the best lessons come from the worst pain i can that's one thing i've found to be true every single time and the the, the biggest growth also comes as that pain increases you know i mean you won't make those mistakes again and so like you just said david when you're trading with bigger size like you're going to remember that you're going to remember yeah. what that felt and that's, yeah, that's, and that's, uh, those are the lessons, you know, it's like the kid touching the stove. You, you don't know how painful it is. You got to touch it first to realize that the thing is you don't want to touch it with a lot of money. I mean, you know, as an analogy, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> you're touching it now, getting it out of the way. Now you, you understand the pain, but, um, yeah, well, anyways, Bryce, we're going to wrap it up now. Uh, we got a, like a minute or so, uh, you want to maybe mention how people can find you in the chat room as you do and small cap recap and rockets and all that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I am Trader Bryce on Twitter, um, Trader Bryce on TikTok, which I haven't used in forever. Um, Bryce Tui on Instagram, T-U-O-H-E-Y. But if for uh, trading related stuff, Twitter is basically kind of my go-to place. And then David, as you were saying, I do um, small cap recap with Matthew Monaco on the Stocks to Trade YouTube channel, which is just kind of like breakdown of the trading day, what was hot that day and how me, uh, what Matt and I traded. And that's on the Stock Trade YouTube channel. And then me, Matt Monaco, and our other friend, John, have a uh, chat room called Small Cap Rockets. A basically goal is to help newer traders uh, learn a long biased trading methods, risk management, and setups. Um, small Cap Rockets and Small Cap Recap, you get, the, you get yeah. it all. But for me personally, Trader Bryce on Twitter, that's probably the best spot to find me. Sounds good. That's cool. I really love the small cap recap. Uh, it, it's like I make it part of my routine now. Thanks, Bryce. Thanks. But yeah, <laughs> uh, I think Sam does too, you know, so, uh, speaking of, but uh, yeah, thanks a lot for coming on with, with Sam and I. We really appreciate it, man. We're, we're big fans of the show. Keep up everything you're doing, man. Uh, we'll see you. I'm pretty sure you're going to, you're going to make a ton of money and, and uh, be, be in Italy and stuff like that with uh, <laughs> again or whatever. Sure. But yeah, thanks, man. You enjoy the weekend and I'll catch you guys later. Thanks for having me on, guys. Bye.